are going to combine sections 617 and 618 together. They are called first order elimination. That's 617. And first order elimination, this is a type of a reaction. It's abbreviated E1. And section 618 is called Saitseff's rule, which pertains to the E1 reaction mechanism. And that, again, is pronounced Saitseff's. Not with a hard z. So this is our reaction mechanism. And the overall general mechanism for first order elimination looks like this. You have, in this case, you need to have an alkyl halide that has at least two carbon atoms. And on the two carbon atoms, you need to have a side-by-side -side hydrogen and a leaving group, which we're just going to abbreviate X because usually it's a halogen. And what happens in the E1 mechanism is that you eliminate the leaving group as well as the adjacent hydrogen, and you end up with an alkene. So we are going to study this reaction just in terms of its mechanism in chapter six, but in chapters seven and eight, when we focus on alkenes, we're going to revisit E1 and study it with a whole lot more detail. So again, this is called E1, first order elimination. And just like SN1, it's very similar to that um, process. It's one molecule falling apart in the slow step, but instead of in SN1 you have one molecule that falls apart and then the nucleophile comes on and essentially replaces the leaving group. In an E1 reaction you have one molecule that falls apart and then that is followed by elimination. Nothing gets replaced. The E1 mechanism competes with the SN1 mechanism, meaning that they tend to both happen at the exact same time. So when you're doing E1, a lot of times you're going to be doing SN1 at the same time and vice versa. E1 and SN1 compete. And in this next example, actually in the first example, you will see exactly what I mean when I say that they compete with each other. So let's take cyclohexyl bromide and we are going to react this with some methanol and a little bit of heat. And so when you see the, the methanol and the heat, it's a sign to you that you're looking at a first order reaction. And that, uh, you should, one thing that should trigger in your brain is SN1 because this is not a strong nucleophile. There isn't any motivation for the methanol molecule to attack this bromocyclohexane as is. This is a secondary alkyl halide, so it's possible for it to do the SN1 mechanism and also E1 as well. Both SN1 and E1 mechanisms are going to start with the formation of the carbocations. They initially have the exact same step. And this is not going to be involving the methanol. It just happens and we get a, a bromide ion, which I'm not going to write in. It may be important to remember, to remind yourself that there is a hydrogen on this carbon. There's a hydrogen on this carbon as well. That's a secondary 
carbocation. Now, in the SN1 sections, hopefully uh, one of the things that really got built into your head was that if you ever see a secondary carbocation when you're doing SN1, you should always ask yourself, can I rearrange, can this molecule be rearranged to form a more stable carbocation? And what we do is look at the carbons that are adjacent. So over here, we could move a hydrogen, a hydride, and that would create a secondary carbocation, so there's no incentive for that. Over here, we could move a hydrogen, but again, that would create a secondary carbocation. No motivation for that. So this molecule is not going to undergo any rearrangement. In this carbocation, you learned that uh, this will react with the weak nucleophile, like methanol, to do an SN1 reaction. I'm going to rewrite the methanol molecule and we are going to draw the SN1 mechanism. So we have the nucleophile attacking the carbocation, and we get a transition state that looks like that. And then we get a second methanol molecule to come along and abstract the hydrogen to stabilize to uh, turn the, the transition state into a product. And that's the SN1 product of this reaction. Now, going all the way back to the carbocation, this carbocation can also do a, another type of reaction, again using a methanol molecule. This methanol, methanol molecule, instead of attaching itself at the carbocation and attacking the molecule that way, this methanol molecule can attack and abstract a hydrogen on a carbon adjacent to the positively charged carbon atom. I'm going to show it going here. It could go here exactly the same, or even if it went up to one of these two hydrogen atoms, it would be the same thing as well. So the electrons from the oxygen go to, to that proton. The carbon-hydrogen um, electrons, the, the electrons in the carbon-hydrogen bond, go to the carbon-carbon bond and create a carbon-carbon double bond. And you end up with an alkene, and you have protonated methanol, which is okay. I mean, you end up so you end up making protonated methanol in this step as well. So it's not not a crazy product to have. So this reaction produces actually produces two different products. The one with the methoxide attached is the SN1 product. And you're going to get a mixture of both of these. And this is the E1 product. This is a two-step reaction, just like SN, excuse me, the E1 reaction is a two-step reaction, just like the SN1 reaction is a two-step reaction. So step one is the formation of the carbocation intermediate. Step two is the abstraction of the proton and the formation of the double bond. And we can draw an energy diagram that's going to have two steps, formation of the carbocation, abstraction of the hydrogen to make the double bond. And that is the end of this little section. Oh, no, sorry. That's the end of section 617, but we're going to continue putting 618 in this as well. So... Zaitsev's rule, which we're not going to study, um, oh, you know what, I need to pause this because we're going to run out of time and we'll do Zaitsev's rule in the next video.